If you haven't been with us, my name is Chris. I'm lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And right now we are in the midst of this conversation, learning to love roller coasters. And, and for the past couple of weeks, we've been settling into this moment, this moment where Jesus says to his disciples something remarkably powerful. Uh, let me take you back to it. John chapter 16, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this reality that Jesus says, no, in the midst of trouble you can have peace because of something that he has done and, and specifically because of things that he has shared with them. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at this and saying, how is that possible? Because all of us understand that life is a roller coaster. All of us understand you can't escape that. There's no way of getting around that. There's no way of avoiding that. And we don't need Jesus telling us that we're going to have trouble. We understand that we're going to have trouble. We've experienced trouble. Some of us right now are in the midst of trouble, which is why you're here. But we've, we've, we've all experienced this. Life is a roller coaster. So how do I... How do I experience peace in the midst of trouble? What is it that Jesus has done and what is it that Jesus shared with them? So we've been settling into this passage and then another passage that goes, I think, hand in hand with it where you actually see this lived out as the early church launches. So in Acts chapter 4, we've been looking at this prayer where the early church, their leaders have just been threatened that they're going to be put to death if they don't stop talking about Jesus. And as they're experiencing that threat, they go to God and the prayer that they pray is actually shocking. Let me remind you of it. Acts chapter 4, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats, the threats on their life, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. As they're experiencing these threats, threats which, by the way, are not just idle threats. As a matter of fact, not long after this, James is actually going to be put to death by the individuals who are issuing these threats. They're not just threats, they're promises. And yet, at the same time, rather than this church saying, get us off of this ride, God, you got to change this ride, they, they instead ask, God, we want to make sure that we ride the ride well. We want to be able to engage your mission, share your message well with boldness. And in week one, we came to these two passages and said, how in the world do you do that? What was it that allowed them to be able to be able to engage the journey that way? And for the past couple of weeks, we've been unpacking that. We've been looking at their prayer and, and kind of their perspective. What, how did they see God? We've been looking at what it was that Jesus shared with his disciples as they're sitting there at the Last Supper and having this conversation together. And we've seen a couple of pieces to this puzzle. So one of them, Anthony shared with us a couple of weeks ago that I think is maybe one of the most critical, if not the most critical, and that is if you're going to ride the ride well, if you're going to engage it and rather than being afraid of it, you can pray for boldness. It's because of the fact that, number one, you know how the ride's going to end which hopefully you understand that Jesus gave his life so that you would know how the ride's going to end, where it is that you're going to end up, who it is that you're going to be with when this is over. People often say, man, I wish how this was, I knew how this was going to work out. You, you do. You know how the ride is going to end. Jesus has made that possible. And then last week we built on that and looked at this next truth, that not only do you have to understand where the ride's going to end, but you have to trust the designer. You enjoy a roller coaster because you trust the designer. You think, you believe that they know what they're doing and God has stepped into our lives and said, no, no, you can trust me. And we saw in their prayer how this church said, you even, you even used Herod and Pontius Pilate to accomplish your plan. We know you understand it. You're the designer. We trust you as the designer. So we've begun to see some of the pieces to this puzzle and some of how they view God, their perspective on God that allowed them to be able to lean into the ride rather than trying to get off of the ride. But we are just getting started. And make no mistake about it, this journey that we're talking about, this is a lifelong journey. I shared it with you, with you here in the third service last week, even where I am on this journey and, and trying to be able to, to ride the ride in a way where I can experience the joy of it, where I can truly trust the design. It's a lifelong journey and there's a lot 
to it in terms of how we view ourselves, how we view God. And so today what I want to do is I want to continue to build on that. And I want to do so by continuing to examine their prayer in particular. Because I think their prayer reveals a lot about their perspective. So I want to go back to Acts chapter 4. And this time I want to look at the first line of their prayer. It's specifically what they start with. And they don't start with a request because boldness is their first request. They start with a statement about God. They address God in a specific way. So listen to what it says. It says, when they heard this, when they had heard the threats, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So they've experienced this. They, they've heard these threats. They realize that there's, there's power behind these threats. And they begin the prayer. And it's very interesting to me. They begin the prayer with a reference, a reference to God's creation, a reference to the creation story. And not just talking about God as the creator in general, but specifically, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. This is a reference back to the creation story. Now, my question to you is this, why? Why do they start with that? And you may say, well, maybe that's just kind of how they started prayers. But one of the things I love about Scripture is as you read through Scripture is that there's no prayers that are repeated over and over and over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, almost every prayer is very unique and specific to the individual. And when you look at this, this prayer is not repeated again. You don't see other prayers that are starting this way. So why? Why? What is it in this moment that brought them back to this story? Now, I think, I think it's about more than just them recognizing God as the designer. Because some of you might say, well, it's just kind of like last week. They're referencing back to the fact that he created the ride, and so therefore you can trust it because he's the designer. I think there's more to it specifically for these believers because of the fact that the early church, the majority of these believers were Jewish. They grew up Jewish. And most of them had experienced Jesus. That's why you see the church explode, especially that first day, because many of them had heard Jesus teach in different places. Many of them had seen Jesus after he'd come back from the dead. And so as soon as they hear this message, immediately they're drawn to it. They give their life to Jesus, and this thing takes off. And so understanding that, understanding that, we understand that as, as, the, as this prayer is being prayed for many of those, and, and whoever it was, we don't know exactly who it was that prayed this prayer, but whoever it was that was praying this prayer is probably Jewish, and they had a very, very good understanding of the creation story. It was, an, it, it was a phenomenally important story that they would have been taught from the time that they were this tall. And I think that there's something in the creation story that many of us, many of us miss that I think influences why it is that they started this way. Now to show you that, what I want to do is I want to go back to the creation story. Most of us think that the creation story is just about the creation story. There's a lot more to it. And there's one thing in particular that I think God wants to make sure we do not miss. As a matter of fact, you can even argue it's one of, if not the most important theme throughout the story. So let me take you back to it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 starts off, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We don't have time to be able to talk through the whole story and, and to work through each of these verses. What I want to do, because that's not really the focus of what we're looking at, what I want to do is I want to jump through a couple of these verses for you to be able to see a theme that God is very clearly presenting as he's using the writer to share this story with us. He does so by using repetition. Now listen to me, as you engage scripture, repetition is one of your best friends. Repetition is basically God sounding an alarm. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. There's something very, very, very important here. So when you see repetition, pay attention. And as you move through, the creation story, you find incredible repetition. So let me take you to verse 10 because it's the first time where we see it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 10, it says, God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 
okay, here's what I want for you to do. As we move through this, every time we come to this word good, I want for you to say it with me. So let's practice it really quickly. So on the count of three, I want you to say good with me, all right? One, two, three. Good. Excellent. Wow, that was, that, that's good volume. I'm impressed there. So as we, as we move through this every time, so we're in, we're in Genesis chapter 1, verse 10. Now let's go to verse 12, just two verses later. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was? Good. I, there's some excitement in this. I, I'm, I'm feeling that. The land... Uh, then we jump down to verse 17. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was? Good. Jump down verse 21. So God created the, the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing which the water, with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was? Good. Verse 25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was? Good. Over and over. Are you, getting to, are, are you picking up on this here? This is not a theme that you should miss. This is not something that's subtle. It's not something that's hidden. Over and over and over again, as you move through chapter one, you see good, 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 good. It's interesting. There's a deviation from it in chapter Two, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Excellent. Somebody was with me. You got it. Like, we need to celebrate that person who actually got it right. And I, we. No, let's do it the right way. The Lord God said, it is not. Good. Now, this is interesting because he deviates in chapter two. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Hopefully you have been inviting and investing in those around you and you have those that you've identified, man, I want them to be on this journey with me. I wanna invite them into this journey with me. When we get to the fall, we're actually going to spend a lot of time with this passage and, and, and we're walking into a conversation called leaving loneliness. Hopefully you're inviting people to be a part of that, inviting to be part of this journey in the, during the summer so that when we get to that conversation in the fall, we can do that together. From the very beginning, God has been warring against loneliness. And he wants to do that in your life. And as we get to the fall, we want to have a powerful conversation about that and how we can experience family and how we can leave loneliness in our lives. But as you move through that first chapter, you see over and over again, as a matter of fact, when he gets to verse 31 in chapter one, he says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Excellent. It's not subtle. It's clearly a theme. He's clearly trying to get our attention. Pay attention to this, listen to this. Now what is he doing? Why does he keep saying this? Is it just that he wants for us to realize how good of a job he did? Just in case you missed it, I kind of crushed you with this one. Just in case you're not impressed with creation, I'm kind of impressed with it. I'm gonna say it's good. Like, what is he doing? Why is, it that, why is it that he keeps saying it? Well, I think it becomes clear when you get just a short, just a short time later because God creates all this and he says to Adam and Eve, okay, here's what I want for you to do. I want for you to take care of this. I've created all of this that is good. I want for you to take care of it and I want, I want for you to enjoy it. But, and he says to them, but there is one thing that's not good. That tree, don't eat from that tree. That will not be good. That will not be good. And as the story goes on, as you, as you see Adam and Eve engage in the garden, it's interesting what happens because we find Adam and Eve in the continuation of the story, not enjoying the good of the garden, we find them hanging out by the tree. Isn't it amazing in life how you can be given so much good and yet you're still obsessed with what it is that you don't have? Isn't it, isn't it amazing how you become... You, we can become so consumed with what it is that's 
off limits. And so as the story continues, we find Adam and Eve not out enjoying and tending for the garden, but, but we find them hanging out by the tree. And they're not eating of the tree, they're just near the tree. Which, to be honest with you, is a story that's fairly similar to ours. As a matter of fact, all of us do this. I, I'm not going to eat of the tree, I, I'm just going to, you know, just going to look at it. Just gonna be, just gonna be near it. Our our culture does this constantly. As a matter of fact, most of us, the majority of our entertainment is things that God has said. No, 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 that's bad. And we entertain ourselves with affairs. And violence. And we say, well, I'm not, I'm not actually, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I just, we read books about it. I mean, it's unbelievable to me the number of, of, of shows that are glorifying drug dealers and the life that they live when in reality, if you were to meet the individuals affected by those stories, it's not good. But I'm not eating of the tree, I'm just near the tree. I'm just... All of us do it. And it's amazing to me how many times I sit down with individuals and they'll say to me, I don't know how this happened. but I know exactly how it happened. You hang out around the tree long enough, you start to dream about what that would be like. I'm not going to do it, I'm just imagining. I'm just, just, just reading a book about it. I mean, it's not really... But here's the thing, and hopefully you understand this. Your imagination has incredible power. And don't be surprised if one day your imagination comes rushing into your reality. How did that happen? It's amazing what happens when you just hang out around the tree. And as Adam and Eve are hanging out around the tree, the enemy comes to them. And he begins to have this conversation with Eve about what it is that God has said. And and what it is that God's doing, and Eve says, well, God says if we eat of it, we're going to die, and the enemy says, well, you're not going to die, and he's trying to get Eve to focus on the physical instead of the spiritual, and you're not really going to die, and there's this back and forth between the two of them, and then the enemy says something really interesting. L listen to what he says. He says, for God knows he says, if you take the truth, he says, the reality is God doesn't want you to have the fruit. And, and, and here's, here's why God doesn't really have, want you to have the fruit. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with you, with you dying. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good. There's that word again. Interesting. The enemy comes to Eve and says, you know what God's really afraid of? God's actually afraid that you're going to know what's actually good. And here's the thing. You don't need God to know what good is. No, no. You can know it without him. And he's terrified that you would know what's actually good. I know he's told you that all of this is good, but, but... He's terrified that you would ever know what's actually good. You don't need God to know what's good. You can know it yourself. And then listen to Eve's response. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining 
wisdom. She takes it. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it, just in case you think that Eve was the only one hanging out by the tree. They were there together. When she saw that it was good, now let me ask you a question. Was it actually good? No. It destroyed everything. Why is it that he keeps using this word over and over and over and over and over again? See, God's using the writer to communicate something incredibly powerful. This reality that there's two ways to engage this journey. You can engage this journey believing that God knows what's good. Or you can engage this journey believing that you know what's good. But understand this, understand this. When you begin to believe that you know what's good above what he's told you is good, it leads to destruction. And so you look at this story of creation and you see this theme that God wants to make sure because he repeats this word over and over and over again. He's drawing our attention. He says, don't miss this about the story. Why? Because when you begin to believe that you know what's good, instead of trusting him about what's good, it goes really, really bad. So why, why? Do they start the prayer referencing back to him being the creator and specifically the creation story? Why? Because I believe, because in this moment, when everything turns upside down, they start off with this. God, you know what's good, and we don't. And that's very important. Why? Because that's not the way we start prayers when life turns upside down. The way we start prayers when life turns upside down is, God, I know what's good, and this isn't it. So you need to turn this thing back upside down. You need, you need to change the direction of this, because I know what's good, and where this is going isn't going to be good. So God, you need to change it. As a matter of fact, most of our requests are based on the reality that we think that we know what's good, and God isn't leading us there. When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he teaches them first to submit your will be done. I believe that this early church is doing the very same thing. When they talk about God being the creator, he says, no, no, you know what's good. We don't know what's happening right now, and things are getting crazy, and things have turned upside down, but here's what we know. You know what's good. We don't know what's good. Everything else that we have to say from this point on is based on that. We trust you. You know what's good better than us. And this is so important because when you, when you think that you know what's good better than him, you reach out and you take control. Not only do you ask him to do what, not only are your prayers based on what you think is good and asking him to do what you think is good, but it's exactly what we talked about a couple months ago when we talked about jumping the wall. Jesus has this conversation where he says, listen, I want to lead you into the, she the sheep pen. I want to lead you into what it is that I have for you. I, I want to lead you into this relationship. I want to lead you into all the plan that I have for you. He said, but some of you, you're trying to jump the wall and you're trying to steal it. You're looking inside. You're saying, I want that, but I don't want to follow you to it. I don't trust you to get me there. So I'm going to jump the wall and I'm going to take it for myself. That's what happens when you think that you know what's good better than him. And as you, read through, as you read through the book of Genesis, it's unbelievable. You see this word good over and over and over and over again, specifically in moments where individuals are taking control of the story and there's phenomenal destruction that comes from it every 
time. Why? Because through the whole story, God's like, listen, listen, listen. I know you think that you know what's good, but you don't. And if you'll trust me, if you'll trust me, I can actually lead you into the good that I have in store, that I've planned for you. But you have to let go of the idea. You have to let go of the idea that you know what's good. And say, no, no, no. I trust you. I trust you. Not just that you're the designer, but you know what's good when I don't. It's interesting, if you go back to that conversation that Jesus had with his disciples as they're at the Last Supper, the one where he said, you can have peace in the midst of the trouble, he says something really fascinating in the midst of that supper. I, I, I want to take, take you to this moment. We find it in John chapter 14. It's before he gets to the point where he says, listen, based on the things that I've told you, you now can have peace. I've told you these things so that you can have peace. You're going to have trouble. He, before he gets there, one of the things that he shares with them is this. Listen to what he says in John chapter 14, verse 30. He says, I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He, he's talking about the fact that he's going to be put to death. He says, listen, I'm not going to be able, I'm not going to speak with you much longer. As a matter of fact, the time is coming for me to actually give my life for you. He says, the enemy is coming for me. He says, he has no hold on me. He says, I want you guys to understand something. What's about to happen is not because he has power over me, but, but, listen to this, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let's leave. What is he saying here? He says, okay, guys, this is about to happen. Something's about to happen. What I, and he'd been telling them for quite a while that he's going to, that he's going to be put to death. They can't figure it out. But he says, okay, guys, the time is here. Now, I want you to understand as we walk through this, this isn't happening because the enemy has power over me. This is happening because I have to show the world something. What do I have to show the world? I have to show the world that I love the Father and that I trust the Father. Trust the Father what? That he knows what's good and I don't. I have to show the world what it is. And as you read through the story of Jesus, if you, if you read through the story of Adam and Eve and you read through the story of Jesus, you're going to see contrast after contrast after contrast where Jesus is stepping in and saying, no, no, this is the way that it happened before, but I want to show you the way that it's supposed to happen. And the same thing happens in this, in this moment. Jesus says, what I have to walk through, there's so much to what Jesus is doing. But one of the things, and he says to his disciples, I want you to understand, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm showing you and I'm demonstrating to the world that you can trust the Father, that He knows what's good. And so I'm going to obey Him, and I'm going to trust Him in this. And it's going to look really bad. But I want you to see, He knows what's good. And it looked really bad, didn't it? But what do we know? It was really good. It was really good. And he says, I want to make sure that the world sees. I want to see the world, for the world to see. that he knows what's good. I love him. I trust him. I'm going to obey what he's commanded, even though it looks bad. Why? So the world can see. No. He's so good. He's so good. Guess what? The world around you needs to see. The 
they need to see that he's so good. How do they see that? When we decide, rather than opting out of the ride, rather than saying, God, you got to change this ride, you got to do what we think is good, when we decide, no, God, you know what's good. So I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to lean into this ride. Why? Because the world needs to see. The world needs to see what it didn't see in the garden. The world needs to see. No. He can be trusted. He knows what's good. And listen to me, he knows the good that he has planned for you. How do you ride the ride differently? You realize, I don't know what's good. But he does. So I trust you. Let's go. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray as we, as we walk through this that we would not just see you calling us to this reality that you know what's good and we don't, but we would understand that it's your love, it's, it's your passion for us that caused you Rather than walking away when we chose what wasn't good, when we ignored you about what was good, when we believed the lie that you were lying to us about what was good, Father, I pray that we would stand in awe of the fact that you in your love pursued through all of that. Because you knew the good that you had planned for us. But beyond that, Father, I pray. I pray that we would embrace what Jesus embraced in that passage. Because we live in a world that needs to know. But there's only one way that to happen for us to decide I don't know we're going to trust you you know what's good and we trust you to lead us into it in Jesus name Amen